Oh my God. Thank you for coming. Um, we're just going to wait another minute or two as we uh, have the rest of our guests filter in. Uh, so enjoy the slides in the meantime. All right, I think we're all ready to get started. So I want to welcome everyone to the uh, West Virginia Center on Climate Change webinar on what are the polls north and south telling us about Earth's climate future. The West Virginia Center on Climate Change is a nonprofit volunteer-led organization that's dedicated to helping West Virginia and our neighbors address the crisis of climate change. We bring fact-based, science-grounded speakers to our community to help ground our community in the information that we need to make our own decisions. So we are so honored today um, to have some really amazing speakers lined up. Um, really briefly, I want to just introduce myself. I'm Penny Dax. I'm a mom here in Morgantown, um, at Morgantown, West Virginia, and I'm a scientist professionally working on different nonprofit research initiatives that are totally unrelated to climate. And I'm joined here by my co-moderator. Hi, I'm Steve Mara, and I have to clear my throat. Isn't that just perfect? <clears throat> I'm a, a dad here in Morgantown, and I am a jack of all trades, master of some, and quite interested in this. So we're joined by some incredible speakers, as I mentioned. Uh, we've got Dr. Brigham Bretti, who's, uh, Dr. Julie Brigham Bretti, excuse me, who served for six years as the department head of geosciences and the chair of the Polar Research Board of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. She is currently president of the American Geophysical Union uh, Global Environmental Change Section, and she's a past president of the Quaternary Division of the Geological Society of America. Dr. Brigham Reddy is a fellow of the American Geophysical Union and the Geological Society of America. I think foundationally she's been conducting research in the Arctic for over 40 years, including eight field sessions in remote parts of Northeast Russia since 1991. She's been a professor at the University of Massachusetts Amherst um, since 1987. Um, and we're honestly just so thrilled that you can join us here. So Dr. Brigham Reddy's gonna start us off with, with a, a just a lot of different insights and talk. And then we've got Dr. Amy weiss Lobel as well as Dr. Christopher Russianello, Russianello, both from West Virginia University, who are gonna give us some comments. And Mr. Ray Pomerantz, who's a senior fellow of the Woodwell Climate Research Center as well, will give us some comments and then we'll bring it up to the entire audience for some questions and comments. And with that, Dr. Reddy, please take it away. Thank you. I will go ahead and uh, share my slides. 
and hopefully you'll see them fine. Okay, can you see those fine? They yeah. look perfect. Okay, and I'm gonna hide those. Okay, well, thank you for this invitation to share with you um, some of my insights about uh, the climate change of both the Arctic and the Antarctic. Most of my research is in the Arctic, uh, but I've been working with colleagues who work in the Antarctic. So I really want us to think about what is it about the past that informs our future? And um, I'm going to um, um, really, here's some my key points. And, and um, mainly that the geologic record shows that both Greenland and West Antarctica have melted away many, many times with just a small change in temperature of the planet. So they're much more vulnerable to change and to melting. And in order, to, and since sea level is permanent, we, we need to mitigate climate change in order to slow it down and we owe it to future generations. So that's really the bottom line if you don't remember anything else. And oh my God, look what's happened in the last week or two. We've got these extremely uh, uh, intense temperatures happening both in on the right hand side in Antarctica, particularly a temperature of like 70 degrees above normal on the over the parts of the East Antarctic ice sheet. No one's ever seen that before. And on the left, um, really, really high temperatures penetrating way up into the into the polar regions like no one's ever seen before. Um, these are pretty extreme. And this, this figure in particular taken off of a Twitter site um, shows you the extreme of the temperatures over Dome C of Antarctica, how out of the box these are. And I've been working in Svalbard, which is a island uh, uh, 400 kilometers north of Norway, where in the last 10 years that I've been working, I've been seeing um, massive retreat of over a, a, a kilometer and a half of, these, of this ice. So every year I go up there, I'm working in a small boat in areas that were covered with um, uh, 100, 200, 300 meters of ice just, um, um, just the year before. So I've seen this happening really fast and um, uh, it's quite remarkable. So, so I like I love this slide because um, I like it, it shows on the bottom these wiggles. They think of climate going up and down, up and down. That's normal climate change, warm and cold. When it goes up, it's warm. When it goes down, it's cold. And you can see that starting on the right hand side, five million years ago, climate was warm above above today's temperatures. And then somewhere in the last million years, we started to really get into the glacial interglacial cycles. And so I'm, you know, I like to always put forward this idea that um, I'm like a time lord from, you know, if you, if you know Doctor Who, uh, if you haven't discovered Doctor Who, I encourage you to look it up. Um, but um, Doctor Who um, always uses a TARDIS, uh, a, a telephone booth, a time machine to go back in time to see what happened and to go forward in time. And we can do that as geologists um, using the geologic record and then also using modeling to go forward. So, so this is the perspective. We're, we're, we're uh, capturing time very efficiently. And so first of all, I just wanna very quickly say, how do we change the temperature of the planet? Well, one way, a long-term way is these glacial interglacial cycles, which operate, um, on tens of thousands of years and, and they drive the ice ages. So that is normal climate change, of course. Um, but what we're doing today is um, driving the temperatures with CO2. And I think you all understand that. We have this really wonderful record from the East Antarctic ice sheet of glacial interglacial cycles showing the changes in CO2, 180, 280, 180, 280, over the last 800,000 years in those ice cores. But where we are now is this vertical line where temperatures are rising really quickly. And I like to put this in the context of my family. Um, so here is um, 
the, the most recent time from about 1850 up to the present. And here you can see that when my grandmother was born, we were at 295 parts per mil. When my dad and mom were born, it was about 305. I was born in 1955 and when it was 313. When my kids were born, it was around 350 and now we're at 418 or almost 420. And so within a duration of my family, and I'll just round it out to 120 years, we've gone from pre-industrial to uh, basically a Pliocene uh, atmosphere that we have today. And so I'm gonna take you through this very complicated diagram, but in pieces, just to show you where we're at. And if you look at, um, so these are, these are four time, time frames, five time frames. On the right-hand side is the recent time. And over here is about 20,000 years ago. Here's earlier in the glacial cycles. And over here is 3 million years ago, and here's 50 million years ago. So let's block that out, all that complexity, and just look at where we are since 1950. And here you see uh, on the top are the car carbon dioxide estimates of various models, depending on the, choos the choices that we make. Um, and then uh, below that are the changes in Earth's temperature. And just for context, just remember that we've already changed the planet 1.2 degrees C from pre-industrial time, 1.2 degrees. So, um, um, and so let's put that in context. So if we now go back and slide over to the next panel, we can see that here is the CO2 level going back to about 180 at the, about 20,000 years ago up to about 280, where we were about 5,000 years ago. And below shows you the temperature changes in the planet. If we go back a little farther to the last interglacial 125,000 years ago, when we were, again, the Northern hemisphere was warm, the ice sheets were small, um, temperature was about one degree above present, but CO2 wasn't that high. So this was an orbitally, um, folk uh, uh, caused warming. And then we go back a little farther to the Pliocene, which is about 3 million years ago. And, and it, this red line here shows you where we're at today. We're at about 420 parts per mil. And that the last time we had an atmosphere outside my window here, anything like this with CO2 was 3 million years ago. So we need to think about the fact that we are now have an atmosphere that's driving the planet back to a condition or, or to a future that looks a lot like the Pliocene. So we wanna think about what does that look like? Um, and we'll go to the Eocene a little bit later. So here's the, again, the Pliocene CO2. This is a graph showing CO2 on the, left uh, on the y-axis here. And then this is 3 million years ago. And again, here's where we are today. We're in, a, we're, we're in an atmosphere out here that's similar to the, to the Pliocene 3 million years ago. So what, what does that mean? What does the Pliocene look like? Well, okay, here's what North America looked like 3 million years ago. And I want you to see a couple of things that are um, remarkable about this image. First of all, oh my gosh, Canada is all one big continent. There's no little island channels. The other thing, there's no Greenland ice sheet. And um, at this time, three million years ago, the global temperatures were three degrees above present. Remember, I told you that today we've already we're already at 1.2 1.2 degrees warmer than pre-industrial, this is three degrees warmer. And um, the reason there aren't any islands up here in, in Northern Canada is because we hadn't eroded those from glaciation yet. Um, but if we go um, and look at, uh, and over here in this red star is a long lake record, I'll just mention briefly about what um, this area looked like that contributes to that. But we have a number of sites, these little yellow dots, 
under, indicate a number of sites where we have a window, little window into what the Pliocene looked like at 3 million years. And, and again, here, here's some images. Um, uh, sites here in Northern, what is now Ellsmere Island show that um, mean annual temperatures there at this time were 19 degrees warmer than present. There were you know, beaver and forests and ponds. Um, there are, is even evidence of, uh, of camel. Probably most of you might be shocked, but there were woolly um, camel in um, Arctic Canada 3 million years ago because of the very different conditions. Um, so, so this is what the world looked like at 400 ppm. So this is what we're driving the planet back to or future uh, right now into what that looked like. Now, I just wanna say, um, when I was a graduate student, uh, you know, 35, 40 years ago, I hate to say, um, but 40 years ago, uh, we were taught that the Greenland ice sheet and Antarctica were absolutely stable, that they had never changed in size in the last few million years. And yet when I started my dissertation, I was mapping these shorelines in Northern Alaska and Western Alaska. And I found shorelines, tens of meters, beach deposits, tens of meters above present. And I knew from knowing the geology that, wow, something had to have melted at the time that these beaches were deposited. And so over time, we, over the last uh, few decades, we've now, um, assembled worldwide, geologists like me have looked at shorelines around the world, and we now have a much better idea about what was happening. And in particular, um, in this little red circle, there's a, there's a big lake system where we got a continuous record back to 3.6 million years. And in that record, so here, here, if you think about, here's these wiggles, climate wiggles, warm and cold, warm and cold, and then, um, uh, coming up to the present. And what we learned was that there were several times in the Arctic when it was war so warm and I could match the shorelines, these red dots here, or red stars, I should say, match the shorelines that we've been able to map in many of them in, in parts of the Arctic. So we knew that it had been warm many times by these orbital changes, not CO2 necessarily, at least after 3 million, but that, that that small change in temperature actually caused these ice sheets to come and go. And new work coming out of uh, Greenland shows that when they drill through the ice, through the ice and into the rock below, they can actually measure um, cosmogenic uh, isotopes which indicate exposure to the atmosphere that indicates that Greenland, in fact, had to have disappeared many, many times over the last 2 million years. That's really new in just the last, um, in the last 10 years. And, and the science community is trying to say, suddenly we realize Greenland is vulnerable to a very small change. And, and we also know that West Antarctica is also changed. Uh, resulting in a small amount of change. So, so if we look at this diagram, just shows you here on the left is CO2. Um, and then these are different time slices. On the left is where we are today with the Greenland ice sheet, the Antarctic ice sheet. And then we've gone from 280 parts per mil to 420. And here we are at this next panel is melting part of the Greenland ice sheet, part of the West Antarctic ice sheet, and that is at one degree above present. So if we go back 125,000 years ago, when the world was one only one degree warmer than present, sea level was six to nine meters above present, okay? So we've already got that baked into the system, and um, uh, so we need to worry about that. And as we go to higher, and higher temperatures here on the right-hand side is um, going up to as much as two or three degrees above present. This is gonna drive us towards sea levels that could be based on our geology, anywhere from 16 to 23 meters above present over 
um, a long period of time. So the question is how fast and how, what is the rate of that? This paper um, is showing just some scenarios, these little pictures of what Greenland might look like. And, and the, from left to right, they go from the observed to a moderate CO2 change to uh, on the right-hand side is business as usual. And if, again, if we choose business as usual, it's um, entirely possible that all of Greenland could be gone by uh, uh, 3000, the year 3000, and that's only 979 years from now. So that's not that far. We used to talk about, oh, the ice sheets are gonna take thousands of years to go. We now are realizing with new modeling and new assessments that these ice sheets can go actually much faster uh, than we thought. So the same is true of Antarctica. In Antarctica, these, these areas in red shown in this figure are um, ice shelves that literally buttress the ice back. They, they hold the ice behind. And, and I wanna show you this, this diagram that shows one of these floating ice shelves where the ice comes off and it floats and it, and that ice right here that you see here, that's about 400 meters thick. So four football fields thick. It's, and it's kind of flopping around there on, 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 as the tides change. But if those ice shelves go, as this diagram shows, here's the ice shelf up here and here it's disintegrating. And then we end up with a, what could be uh, almost eight or 900 meter cliff. This is not stable. And so um, we're worried, people working in Antarctica are worried what's happening in Antarctica where we've lost many of the ice shelves already around the Antarctic Peninsula, that this could unleash um, rapid sea level change. And so I want you to think about this like, you know, in Notre Dame, if you've seen any of the videos after Notre Dame in, in Paris burned, they were so worried that if the arches collapse, the whole building would collapse. And that is exactly the way the ice sheets operate, is if we lose the ice shelves, those buttressing ice shelves that are floating out there, if they fall apart, these gigantic walls of ice will not be stable. And so if we get rid of those, then we could see very rapid collapse. And we saw that happen in, in the year 2000 where the Larsen B ice shelf over a matter of three months uh, went from this to this, just fell apart in no time. And it, it resulted in the glaciers up here accelerating um, up to three times faster in flow, putting much more ice into the, into the ocean and of course rate causing rise in sea level. So this is where um, these projections that you've seen about sea level rise are really important because we need to know how fast is it going to happen and when is it going to happen? That's what policymakers need to know. And, and yet um, some of these ideas are rather unpredictable as to how fast they will go. But this is certainly our future is certainly relevant to policy. What we do now impacts where we're, where we're gonna be in the future and the challenges that we're gonna face. Um, and just um, a final note on uh, timescales, I wanna go to this left-hand diagram here. Uh, I might skip over this a little bit quickly, but if we go back even 55 million years ago, there was a time period called a PETM or Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum. And at that time we had, um, and I'll skip this a little bit, but we had a huge um, uh, outburst of, of CO2 and methane. Some people think it's from volcanism and that mimicked what we're doing today. In fact, what we're doing today is 10 times faster than what happened 55 million years ago. And, and that caused a five to six degree temperature rise in, in, the, earth, in the planet and massive extinctions in our surface oceans massive extinction. Now, the problem is, take a look at this diagram. This shows temperature on the left-hand side and the duration of the uh, emission of all this carbon. 
And the importance of this diagram is that the red line shows you what we're doing today compared to what happened 55 million years ago. And so what we're doing today is so much faster than what the geologic record has shown has, has been able to even, um, uh, you know, that we've experienced. And to put that in a different context, this figure here shows the emissions of carbon on the left, and here's time scales going forward in the, in, the, in the future. And here we are in this particular figure from this paper, 2015, the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. And, and if you think about it, this is only, we're gonna reach five to six degrees or these, this 55 million year record of CO2 in only 140 years or maybe 250 years, somewhere in that range. But that's where we're headed. And, and, I, and I just want to remind you that when I started out, my grandmother was only born 120 years ago. So what we're looking at in the future is only within a few generations of, of the past. So this is, we need to understand the time frame that we're, that why high ambition and urgency is so important. Because if we don't change where we're headed, we're going to end up where we're going, like this proverb says. And I want to bring this back to some research I'm doing, working with indigenous people in Alaska on the yukon kuskokwim Delta in southwest Alaska. This is essentially the Bangladesh of Alaska. It's a place, a huge delta, lots of indigenous people on the, what they're experiencing is the melting of the permafrost the lowering of the land at the same time sea level is coming up. So here is a small village um, and again, no running water, no sewer. These, these are really remote villages and yet they're getting flooded. Do they move? How do they move? Who's gonna pay for this? The recent sea level projections from NOAA came out and I just showed you that for something kind of slightly in your backyard showing you it just in the last, in the next 30 years, what areas of the coastline are likely to be flooded um, annually, uh, uh, which will cause uh, certainly damage to infrastructure. And so these projections from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change are, are serious. We have this red line here is showing you what might happen if those ice shelves collapse. It's, we don't know if that's possible, but we, it's possible, but will it happen? We don't know. We can't say we're scientists, but I wanna say that everything about keeping the, the temperature of the earth below one and a half degrees or even lower is consistent with the sustainability goals of the United Nations, uh, whether it's, whether it's uh, poverty or education, all of these things are consistent with that. So we look at the IPCC, okay, we can think, okay, it's the Atlas of Doom, we, what do we do? Um, but the problem, the thing is, we have a lot in, in our um, back pocket. We know we can um, change, we have the um, capacity with engineering, environmental feasibility, technology, economics, and we just have to get everyone else on board to think about, yes, this is possible. And I wanna end here um, on this um, note of optimism. Um, if you haven't heard about the S-curve, the S-curve of innovation and technology, um, um, this is a curve that shows the time frame for adaptation to new technologies. And so um, when I first learned about that, this, this, they showed a picture of a parade in New York City in 1905, and it was all horses and one car. And then by, you know, um, by 1920, it was one horse and all cars. And so that there's this very fast adaptation to anything that comes along. And whether it's radio, color TVs, computers, internet, and the, the adaptation is getting steeper, faster. So if we think about it, whether it's the telephone, clothes washers. I remember being a first grader realizing I was the only family in the whole area that had a dishwasher. <laughs> um, I can still remember that. And yet 
we've adapted cell phones, the internet, and we are now on that steep, somewhere on that very low end of the, of the S-curve with wind and, and green energy, uh, solar panels. Uh, my house is completely run on solar panels right now. Um, we're, we're in that stage. And so we have great optimism of switching off fossil fuels and moving our economy to a greener economy. And it's really important that we do that because we don't really have much wiggle room. So this is a figure from the climate action tracker showing we're at, at 1.2 degrees. Here at the top of this green bar is this little temperature gauge is one and a half. We have to keep ourselves well below that in order to slow down sea level rise, slow down all the other things in extreme weather that we see. Um, and so we do need to um, reach out and, and increase ambition. And I think if, if anything, we have learned from the pandemic that everyone in the world is connected. We're connected more than we ever realized. This atmosphere and the ocean connects us all. And I really um, am optimistic that we can turn this around. So I really um, look forward to your questions and I'll I'll end there. And I'm gonna stop my sharing. All right, everybody, we've got two panelists here that I'm gonna introduce. Dr. Amy, and I'm gonna try and get it right. I spelled it out phonetically. This is this is a whole separate thing. Weiss Lobel. Ah, awesome. Dr. Amy Weisslogel is an associate professor of sedimentary geology at West Virginia University. Dr. Weisslogel received her PhD in geology from Stanford University. She leads a research group in sedimentary basin studies at WVU in which they use grain scale to basin scale techniques to reconstruct tectonic and paleoenvironmental systems. I don't know what that means, but I'm really happy you're here with us. <laughs> we expect to have a mission here shortly. Uh, next on our panel, and again, another, if I mess it up, I'm going to try it. That's spelled phonetically. Dr. Christopher Russo Niella. Okay, I stumbled a little bit, but there you go. Uh, Dr. Christopher Russo Niella is an assistant professor of geology at West Virginia University. Dr. Russo Niello's teaching focuses on coastal groundwater, surface water, groundwater interactions, climate, and groundwater. He received his PhD in geology from the University of Delaware. Dr. Russo Niello, oh, see, I messed it up. Four in a row, sorry. Leads a research group that explores the interface between the earth, freshwater, and the ocean. His research is interested in understanding how physical hydrologic processes influence water quality and movement across the globe, especially how surface water and groundwater interact in streams, lakes, and oceans. So we have some questions. What I want is for the panelists to speak first to what was presented, and then we'll go to some questions. And, and Mr. Ray Pomerantz will follow the two of you, and then we'll bring it up for everybody online. And anybody online listening, please go ahead and put your questions into the Q&A, and then we'll be ready to launch into those um, as soon as we can. Uh -huh. Dr. Weiss Mobile, you want to get started? Thank you. Yeah, I was, um, you know, love hearing Julie's research. I've, you know, followed it for years. It's really great. Um, my interests also lie in looking to the past to help us uh, better understand the future that we're uh, facing. And <laughs> currently, we're facing our future today. Um, and uh, my uh, thoughts kept uh, drifting to, you know, Julie's plots that showed the history of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. Um, which we're you know having to go further and further back into the geologic record to find a, a, a past that we can compare our future to. Um, and if you actually keep going back in time to around 320 to you know 290 million years ago, that's the age of the rocks that Morgantown, West Virginia sits on. And of course, in those rocks are the coal seams 
that were the foundation for our economy um, and also the, the source of much of the carbon in the atmosphere today. And so when I drive around West Virginia and some of my research is, is looking at these rocks, you'll notice um, lake deposits with river deposits and coal deposits kind of stacked up in these layers. And what's remarkable to me is the, the rapidity of those changes. Um, we see it in shoreline deposits, um, like Dr. Brigham Gretty was, is, has been studying. Uh, it's harder for us to actually know what the forests were experiencing during those same time periods. Uh, during the, the more recent periods of history, the, we don't have a lot of stacked up deposits um, preserved in Canada, for example. They've been wiped away by the glaciers. So, um, you know, it got me thinking about how we look at these, these rocks uh, in West Virginia and the time period that they were forming in, we had actually similar CO2 levels. We had very large ice sheets and we see whole like rainforests, like, you know, Amazon type rainforests come and go quite quickly. Um, and it's uh, another area of concern that we know there's sea level rise uh, implications for losing these ice sheets. Um, it also appears that, that the, this is a global connected system and we might see, you know, implications for our, our forests, which is important because they're helping us take the carbon out of the atmosphere. Uh, and we really need to keep that uh, in all of the modeling and all of the, you know, considering potential solutions. Uh, having our forests suck up a lot of carbon dioxide is, is really important. <laughs> it's really helpful. Um, so, yeah, so these... The, the, the number of kind of questions that are, that are still really pressing um, are there's are quite abundant. We need lots of people to kind of be interested in those questions. Um, and I think uh, Dr. Brigham Gretty's pr presentation did a great job of making the, the, what the earth science community is studying relevant to what policymakers are trying to, to grapple with. And there, uh, there is a lot of reason for hope. We have a huge um, knowledge base that's growing every day. We have a whole, uh, you know, stack of, of rocks that we can use to actually help us solve the problem. We've got innovative technologies. Uh, there's actually no shortage of, of options um, in a way. It's a matter of coming together around those options to make them a reality. Chris, do you have something you sure, want to um start? Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting hearing um, Drs. Weiss Logel and, and Brigham Gretty speak about this. I, I'm not a deep time thinker the way that they are. You know, they're talking about thousands of years, millions of years, tens, hundreds of millions of years. And I really think about sort of processes that are happening right now. Um, so the data that I think about is things that I can go out and collect today or, or possibly things that we've been collecting for maybe decades, but that's, that's really about it. I'm not, I'm not thinking back further. And the kinds of data I look at are showing some of the things that, that we're talking about here and, and showing changes. So some of the things that I'm thinking about um, with my research today is what happens as we are seeing these change in the Arctic, what, you know, how does that change things? Um, and as we're just sort of melting everything, all the hydrology up there is changing. Um, the place where we can build are changing as, as things soften. Um, all, those, all those impacts that are, are happening are affecting a, a small group of folks that have lived up there comfortably for a long time. So I always think about how interesting it is that um, sort of what we're doing here is impacting them them uh, so much up there because of uh, sort of the fragility of the system. Um, but I really like the message at the end um, that we can sort of address a lot of these things um, by being creative, by coming together, um, by really leaning on technology and expertise to, to solve these issues um, and just working as, as one group of folks to to fix what we can and adapt in other ways. Great comrades. Thank you. Um, so I just the first to say a word. I'm from Seneca Rocks, West Virginia, and uh, I'm a climate policy person, and I've been in the field for about. Well, this is my fifth decade. Uh, so I'm really uh, delighted to be here. I've known Tom Rod for decades as well. So I thought, that's, listen, I want to use another geographical term here. What does all of this have to do with Florida? Okay. Just to 
change perspective for a minute and talk about its relationship. So about 10 years ago, I was part of a group. We established a new organization or network called Arctic 21. And the purpose of that organization was to communicate what we call the unraveling of the Arctic. Well, what's that mean? Uh, Julie test on, touched on a number of elements, but what we were witnessing was the loss of sea ice, spring snow cover, therefore the Earth's reflectivity, permafrost is thawing, and will release uh, very large amounts of carbon dioxide and methane as it does. We're losing the high altitude glaciers in Canada, Russia, and Alaska, which these are small glaciers compared to Greenland, but they are expected to contribute about 18 inches of sea level rise in this century. And then of course, Greenland is shrinking and you saw uh, a really uh, uh, profound uh, presentation by Julie. So, uh, we, the basic idea is a policy person. The Obama administration was taking over the eight nation body called the Arctic Council. And we thought it's time for the United States to stand up and communicate the unraveling of the Arctic. So we uh, argued that they should make climate a central theme of their chairmanship and they did. Now, what results from that is uh, two uh, big questions that, uh, again, Julie just implicitly touched upon. What is the future state of the Arctic? Do we know? Well, we can model it, but have governments looked at that very carefully? The answer, not in my opinion. Related question, what is the Arctic we have to have to sustain the global climate system? Again, a question for governments, not really answered. Uh, authoritatively or clearly enough. Okay, so what's all this have to do with Florida, right? Answer, this is the politics of it. The fate of Greenland is the fate of Miami. Very simple. You connect the Arctic and the, and the glaciers and the ice sheets to the fate of a state that is very powerful, very large, big economy and important politically. Okay, so, uh, the final thing I wanted to talk about is the policy opportunity. And it turns out that here in West Virginia, as you all know, we have the most powerful politician on this question in the country. Because uh, Senator Manchin has a chance as that swing vote to enact this, uh, the, many of the climate portions of the Build Back Better program. So I've been sitting out there in Senator Rock saying, well, what can I do about this? I, you know, it turns out, well, the key actor in terms of US policy is our Senator here in West Virginia. And then just to, the, the thing that sort of suggested was worth talking about this is that in two weeks, Senator Manchin is speaking to a group called Arctic Encounters full of diplomats, Policymakers from all over the world, the United States, the energy industry. This, this group is convening in Anchorage. I, I imagine things coming in by video, but this would be an opportunity for Senator Manchin to lay out his vision about how we deal with this with, with the crisis. So, uh, and, and the, many of the themes that he has outlined the transition issues, the technology issues, are. Uh, even the relationship to the tragedy of Ukraine and the oil issue, because what we know is we've got to reduce oil consumption, ultimately to zero, but we have to go through a transition and the technologies of electric vehicles and so on are a big part of that. The fundamental approach that we used in Order 21 that we concluded is you have to move all policy mechanisms forward simultaneously, decarbonization, removal of, of other gases, uh, carbon removal from the atmosphere, sequestering as much carbon in the natural world as possible and investigating uh, interventions, climate interventions like solar radiation management. We don't know enough, nearly enough about those, but we need to do the research. So uh, we here in West Virginia have a big, a big moment coming up. Thank you. Thank you all. That was a lot of information. I know I learned a lot. Um, 
I'm going to start off with one question and then see if you want to bring one into the audience. Um, so, Julie, you talked about uh, that we've had high carbon levels in the past, right? So, can you describe for everyone why was the carbon dioxide level so high, I think 400 parts per million in the past, when it wasn't being caused by people? Yeah, I mean, I think what what geologists, what we all can share with you is that if you go back 65, 70 million years ago, we had a tropical world. I mean, the, even there were dinosaurs in northern Alaska who tolerated darkness, but they it was warm enough, tropical enough. And because CO2 was well above a thousand parts per mil, maybe even 100, 1500 parts per mil. And then over the last 60 million years, we've had the uplift of the Himalaya mountains, the building of the Rocky mountains, it's probably almost unthinkable, but we've gained all these mountainous regions. And when you uplift the mountains, the rocks start to weather. And the equation for taking silicate and carbonate rocks, and weathering them, um, pull CO2, it's basically take CO2 out of the atmosphere to make the byproducts of weathering. And so the uplift of mountains caused the decrease in CO2 over time. And so once we pass through about 500 parts per mil, that's at 34 million years ago, that's when Antarctica started to be glaciated. And then we passed around 200, 80 parts per mil in the northern hemisphere started to be glaciated. So we were coming down from a tropical high, call it, <laughs> and to where we were. So the Pliocene gives us a glimpse as we were passing through that de decrease happening because of uplift, gives us an idea what the world would look like if we went back to that level, which is, of course, where we're at now. So, so we were there because we were coming off a high and the earth system, as we move the continents around with tectonics uh, and build mountains, we actually weathered our way to a um, lower CO2. And I was gonna ask one other, uh, so that almost sounds kind of interesting, <laughs> tropical. Uh, and I'm, I'm trying to think about what some of the West Virginians around us might be thinking where we have so many problems in our state, you know, and you're talking about sea level rise, but we don't live near the sea. Can you, do we have anything to learn from those past epics in what the Appalachian region might be able to expect in terms of changing, like less more extreme weather? I mean, how is this going to directly affect what the people living here go through? Oh, I, I think you're already experiencing flooding events, big floods. Um, increasing weather patterns. I mean, I was just listening tonight on the news about the tornadoes that just went through New Orleans. You're having more of these extreme events. And, um, you know, our uh, land use policies are not consistent with high rainfall. And, and uh, so the, you know, even here in Massachusetts, we're, we're now any culvert built for a roadway is built larger in order to accommodate high, um, you know, getting seven, eight inches of rainfall in 24 hours, which is happening more frequently. And that's the kind of thing that we, we cannot build in floodplains anymore like they have in Houston. Um, uh, we really have to think about these extreme flood events in order to adapt and, and we also have to change our laws. I mean, there's parts of laws, um, and I'm not a scholar in this, but my understanding is that if you get money from FEMA, you get the money to rebuild in place, not to, to rebuild somewhere else. And that's silly that we're having homes rebuilt again and again and again, one disaster after another, only because these rules are there. So we need to think about how we move our, our um, our laws and how we help people out to move them out of harm's way. So we're not um, doing that. And I, and I, I think, again, I can't emphasize enough that the, the job generation that's going to come from all of these um, 
uh, adaptations and modifications. So, and, and I'm a big believer that people who may be losing a job in coal need to be retrained in something. We're responsible for that. We need to take ownership of that. And I just want to make that clear that I'm in that camp that we need to help people adapt and move. We can't just abandon whole towns that have spent decades living in, on a coal economy. That's, that's not fair. And it might bring them opportunities so they can help themselves. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we've, we've got quite a few. I wanted to, I'm being flashed a note. Are you going to save that note? Why can't you ask a question <laughs> and then we'll find out what the note is? I want to ask you first, since you've been sitting here, do you have a question? Well, yeah, um, I'm a physicist and always been a bit of a techno optimist. Uh, when I look at that technological adaptation curve, like Julia, I think it was, and I, I think we learn uh, about, but we tend, we tend to need to learn how maybe not to use as much energy as we use it. Just because we can use energy doesn't mean we should use energy. And it requires yeah. a, a spiritual, uh, non religious, but spiritual adaptation and going within oneself and saying, I'm going to learn more about this. I'm going to change my lifestyle to. You know, so is that, this is where I'm going. I'm, I wonder what you think about that. Yeah, I mean, I I decided I needed to walk the walk. Okay, so I put um, a large array of sound. I covered my so my my roof with solar panels. I had to take out a loan for thirty seven thousand um, dollars. There were some rebates I got from the state and the federal. Um, but in six years, I paid off those solar panels. And this year is the first, we added a lot of these um, ductless mini split type systems to our house. And this is the first winter we've not had to use any fossil fuels in our house. And it's been great. We now have air conditioning that we didn't have before. And, um, uh, and I, and I have to say, I mean, I'll just be quite honest. I mean, over the, all these six years, we're producing so much, so much power off our roof that you know we've got thousands of dollars given back to us from the energy companies to pay for what we're contributing to the grid. And I think we really need to. My neighbors are saying, "Hey, how'd you do that?" So we really need to to think about upgrading our grid system all across the country, and. And, you know, it's, it's breaks my heart to fly into Norman, Oklahoma and not see a single solar panel in a very sunny place. It, you, you, we have to get our heads around how we do this. And, and just like, you know, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'll use an analogy. When I was in high school and going into college, I got my first calculator. It added, subtracted, multiplied, divide, maybe did square roots, and it cost me $100. Oh my God, now you can get that in a cereal box. So this technology is all gonna get um, cheaper, but we also have to drive it in that direction, drive innovation and drive, you know, can't get an electric car right now because they're so popular. My next car is definitely gonna be electric. And um, this is why I come back to that S curve of you know change. We've really got to think about how fast innovation will happen, and look at the positive changes that this can have on our economy and also on jobs and stability going forward. All right, I'm going to do a three-minute sprint with questions from the people <laughs> who were online. All right. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read it. And I'm going to ask you all to give me one thing that you think applies to this question, okay? All right, the first one you may have already answered, Miss Big and Gritty, Dr. Big and Gritty. So it's geoengineering and technologies that we need. What are the ones that you all think need to come to the fore for us to tackle? Well, I'll just say 
sequestering CO2 and bringing it out of the ground naturally is, or putting it back in the ground in some fashion is probably the most important thing we can do in addition to decreasing and changing our energy sources. Okay. Amy, Chris? Yeah. Or I will. <laughs> Really tough question to answer, but go ahead, Chris. You, you go. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. I think I think the number one thing that we need to do is change how we're using our energy and, and use less of it. Um, grabbing CO two and, and shoving it in the ground is uh, difficult and hard. It's much better to keep it there. Um, so that would be number one. Yeah, leave it in the ground. Yeah, I'll, I'll just a, a word that R and D's essential policy component of climate change investment by the federal government wide range of high risk technology, including the one for the question, are a central pillar of policy. That's how you advance these high risk investments to get to the kinds of technologies we need. We, the United States established a program called Advanced Research Projects Energy during the W. Bush administration. It was funded under Obama. That R&D program is a central component. Look at all these options. Yeah, the, the, there's a kind of two angles to approach this, you know, obviously carbon dioxide is a major controller of the, the temperature. Um, and like Chris said, once it's out in the atmosphere, it, like it's a slow process to get it back into some other state where it won't, you know, contribute to warming. Um, that's why people have also considered, you know, making the earth more reflecty. And, and so there's, ideas involving you know putting things in the atmosphere and all of these are essentially untested so the way i look at it is you know we're conducting these really uh, unprecedented experiments with our earth system that sustains our societies and our our, our lives <laughs> um so all of them carry some amount of you know risk we can try to mitigate that as much as possible but we're at a point where we're going to have to do some of those things. I think just, you know, if we are able to reduce our carbon emissions to zero today, we're still locked into a certain um, outcomes that we're, we want to avoid and, and we'll only get worse if, if we don't do some of those. So it'll be um, also, I think the ones that we can collaborate on, like, you know, in a as large of scale as possible are the ones that hold the best opportunities for getting the most um, bang for your buck, so to speak. Now, can, I, can I just add that the idea of putting sulfate in the atmosphere is stupid because when the volcanoes do that, you know, yeah. it causes a, a, a huge change in the hydrology of the planet. The, the monsoon systems shut down. There is no way we want to put sulfates in the atmosphere and then deprive all of Southeast Asia and India of water. So. There, there are these unintended consequences of a lot of these engineering that has to be considered. I just want to make sure we understand that some are good, some are not so good. Mm -hmm. All right, and to quickly cut off so we make our time, I would like to thank Drs. Brigham Reddy, Russo, uh, I messed it up. Russell Thank you. <laughs> and Weiss Logan. Well, and uh, Mr. Pomerantz. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> Got it. Close it up. Uh, our next webinar is May 16th on utility scale solar. And please visit us at wbclimate.org. Thank you for everything. The, the registration is open wvclimate.org, May 16th, Utility Scale Solar with uh, David Feldman from the National Renewable Energy Lab. See you all there. Thank you for your time. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, doctors. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.